You are now listening to episode 34 of the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This is the Focus on Fitness Workshop, hosted at We Align Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com. So today's workshop is called Focus on Fitness, uh, and that is the, a really important name, and, and we expected a small turnout because a lot of people, they, they don't want to be told that they need to exercise, right? Or they don't want to, like everybody knows that. Would you guys agree that everybody knows that exercise is important? Everybody knows that exercise helps. Everybody knows that they need to exercise. They don't want to be told again. So out of these three questions, these are the three most important questions that you're going to ask when it comes to exercise. Which of these do you guys think is the most important? Why, what, or how? Why do you think that? Mm. You just know the answer. <laughs> you won't do it if you don't have that. Exactly. You won't do it if you don't have a why, if you don't have a reason. And everybody knows what, everybody knows how to exercise. There's literally an unlimited amount of options for exercise, just getting moving. You can just shake, shake every muscle in your body, and you're exercising. Your muscles, your lungs, your blood vessels, everything's going to start pumping, and you are exercising. So we're going to focus today mostly on why, okay, and why to exercise. So we're going to look mostly at our mindset and how our minds work when it comes to exercise, when it comes to fitness. And fitness is the most important word here, not exercise. What do people associate with exercise? You guys think people like exercise or they don't like it? Yeah, they don't like it. They don't like it. And I'm the same way, okay? I don't really like to exercise. I hate going to the gym, but I love having fun. Okay, and there's a lot of fun things that are exercise. So fun to me is hiking, fun to me is skiing, fun to me is running or just being active, playing with my kids. That's fun to me. So I get my exercise just by having fun. So that's the important thing is to think about focusing on fitness and what fitness really means rather than focusing on exercising and doing more exercise. So the first thing that we have to address is that you might be delusional when it comes to your exercise. Most people in our country are delusional when it comes to their exercise. So when they've surveyed people and asked them about their health habits, 85% of people believe that they lead a healthy lifestyle. What do you guys think? Are 85% of Americans healthy? Yeah, uh, no, yeah, no. Uh, Two thirds are overweight or obese, and 85% is a, that's a much exaggerated number. So you have to understand first and foremost, that you may be delusional, okay? Uh, 47%, so about half of people, said that they have good nutrition knowledge. How, how many people do you think have good nutrition knowledge? 47%? Half people? Yeah, yeah, I'd say about, yeah, maybe. And, and, and still, what does that mean, really, you know, good nutritional knowledge? Like, if you know the USDA food pyramid, That might be considered good nutritional knowledge. I I might argue that. Uh, But 47% of people do not have good nutritional knowledge. 51%, so another half of people, said that they exercise more than three times a week. Do you guys think that's true? Do you think that's real? No, I I, I highly, highly doubt it. But, but, you know, if you ask people, you ask people, you know, how's your exercise, how often do you exercise, and say they walk three times a week, they might consider that exercising, okay? And, and that's something that we have to differentiate. We're not talking about movement. Movement is something that everybody has to be doing all the time or you're dying. You're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. They say sitting is the new smoking. Everybody has to be moving. So that's what walking is. Walking is just movement. Walking is not exercise unless you're really elevating your heart rate. So you may be delusional. And, and 32% thought that you must be exhausted at the end of a cardio workout for it to be effective. And how many people have heard that or thought that before, that if I'm not exhausted, I didn't get a good workout? I would say that these numbers, you know, they, they might be uh, reflective more of like the population in our office. 
that 85% of people believe they lead a healthy lifestyle, that half of people say they have good nutritional knowledge, half of people say they exercise more than three times a week, but in the general public, that's not the reality. So you may be delusional. And we have to realize with this is, you know, we have this thing called an ego, right? And everybody's heard this word, the ego, and, and we think of ego like a brash, cocky, confident, person that's really egotistical, really self-centered, but most of us have a, have a warped uh, perception of what ego is. The ego's number one goal, the only thing the ego does is try to protect you, try to protect you. So when somebody asks you, hey, do you think you exercise? Yeah, I do pretty good. Hey, do you think you eat well? Yeah, I do pretty well. So that's what we tell ourselves, and we're delusional, and we're telling ourselves, yeah, we're doing pretty good. We always find somebody that we're doing a little bit better than to compare ourselves to, but it's a protection mechanism. Thank you for helping me here, Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> so you may be delusional. So you guys that just walked in, we're just talking about uh, some of the basics of focusing on fitness, and we just talked about some of these stats. I'm gonna read through them real quick again, but we said 85% of people, when surveyed, thought that they lead a healthy lifestyle. And that's just not the reality, that 85% of people in our country are not healthy today. Half of people said they have good nutritional knowledge. Half the people said that they, have, that they exercise more than three times a week. And a third of people thought that you must be exhausted at the end of a cardio workout for it to be effective. And one of the things we're gonna talk about it is that this came out yesterday. Ellie was telling me about this yesterday that a new study came out that you only have to exercise for one minute, one minute at high intensity and you get more benefit than 45 minutes of cardio, was it? 45 minutes of cardio, one minute of high intensity exercise. So we're gonna change some of your perceptions on exercise today and change your focus and your mindset. So here's the reality though, that's what people think, is people think, you know, 85% of people think that, that they lead a healthy lifestyle, but here's the reality. Uh, only 20% of people exercise the way that they should. Okay, remember what the last slide said? 50% said they exercise more than three times a week, so they're just delusional, they're not really doing what they think they're doing. 68.5%, over two thirds of people are overweight or obese, adults. A third of America's youth, a third of our children are unfit for military service. They can't be accepted into military service because they don't have the physical fitness level to carry out the actions that are necessary. In 50 years ago, you know, say around World War II time, it was hardly anybody that wasn't physically fit. When they do a draft and stuff, they just pull you up, you just assume that you're fit enough for the military. Today, you have to go through a lot of screening because a third of people can't even handle the basic duties. Uh, here's our kids, here's the, the following percentages of children are overweight or obese. The, the, the first one's the most disgusting, right? Two to five years old. Two to five years old, over 10% of our kids are overweight or obese. That's Rio and Ruby and Reynolds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, all those, yeah, it's obese kids. And, and that's the problem today is that, you know, we used to see chronic diseases start at 50, start at 60, you know, heart disease, diabetes, start at 70, arthritis. We're now seeing it start in kids. Our kids are diabetic, are pre-diabetic. It's, it's an epidemic, it's the fastest growing disease worldwide, and children are the fastest growing population getting this disease. So that's the reality. So you have to start off by just realizing that you, know, you might be delusional. You probably don't exercise the way that you think you do. And that's not to say that, that you're crazy, right? But it's just to say that you, know, you need to address and assess and think, Am I really doing the exercise that I need to be doing or that I think I'm doing? So what does it mean to, to be fit? Because we said that you know, when 85% uh, of people said they exercise at least three times a week, that might just be walking. Okay, and so we said that walking is just movement. Walking is not really exercise. And fitness is what we really want to focus on, not exercising, because exercising, we carry such a negative connotation with it. So what does it mean to be fit? Uh, I'm going to read this bottom one first. So dictionary.com says, it's the capability of the body 
of distributing inhaled oxygen to muscle tissue during increased physical effort. Okay, that's like the, the scientific term, what is fitness? You breathe in oxygen, your blood takes the oxygen out to your muscles, and when it can do that efficiently, you're fit. Okay, so think about this. When you walk up a flight of stairs or you run up a flight of stairs, the person who's unfit, their muscles, their legs have to get them up the stairs. They get to the top of the stairs. Their body is saying, oh my gosh, we need more oxygen. Their hands are on their knees. They're huffing and puffing. That's what their body's doing. It's saying we need more oxygen because it's not very efficient at getting that oxygen out to the muscles. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you know, somebody who's fit, and fitness you know, doesn't have a look, doesn't have a name, doesn't have an age. This could be somebody in their 80s. They run up those stairs and they're fit and they're completely fine, right? And it's your ability to withstand any resistance and your ability to adapt to that resistance that makes up your physical fitness. So I like this answer a little bit better. It's from answers.com. Physical fitness is commonly defined as the capacity to carry out the day's activities, pursue recreational activities, and have the physical capability to handle emergency situations. Right? We always talk about you know, how, how our bodies were designed. What were we designed to be able to do? What were our ancestors designed to be able to do? And we've all heard of the fight or flight physiology, fight or flight, your stress response. That means if you run into a danger, if you run into something that's bad, your body prepares you to fight or to flight. But if you don't have physical fitness, you're not really capable of fighting or flighting. You can't run away from a, a bear in the woods. You can't fight uh, you know, an enemy. You can't kill an animal, you can't hunt, you can't really gather, you can't do the things that you need to do ancestrally. Now today, you can't go up a flight of stairs. You can't throw your kids in the air. You can't do your daily activities when you don't have physical fitness. So here's a couple more just facts on fitness, on why it's important. Uh, here's a, one that's you know, pretty, pretty common sense, but regular physical activity, fitness, and exercise are critically important for the health and well-being of people of all ages. And you hear this a lot like with, with our kids, you know, they take away gym class, they're taking away recess, and kids are hyperactive, kids are, you know, and then they feed them a bunch of sugar and a bunch of junk, and kids are getting sicker and sicker and sicker. You just picture a kid what a kid wants to do all day. They want to play, they want to run. When you take those things away from them, it not only affects them mentally, it affects them big time metabolically. And that's the concern is that when you start a metabolic shift in a two to five year old, think about where they're gonna be when they're 20, when they're 30, when they're 40, when they're 50. And the thing is, is all these shifts though, they're damaging, but they're reversible. All these metabolic shifts are reversible. So and millions of Americans today suffer from chronic illnesses that could be prevented or improved through regular physical fitness. And like we said when we started off, everybody knows this, right? It's one of those things, it's the weirdest thing to look at. Everybody knows they should exercise. Everybody knows that exercise is healthy for them. Nobody's doing it. So where's the disconnect? If you know you should be doing something and you're not, you're purposely sabotaging yourself. So that's why out of the why, the what, and the how, we're gonna spend the most time talking about the why. The law of adaptation, that's an important thing with fitness, your body adapts proportionate to any demand that's placed on it. So that means that you know, if you're just completely unfit, you start off slow because your body's going to adapt to that. First, you can run up one flight of stairs or run up a hill once and come back down and you're done for the day, but then your body adapts to that. The next time you're able to run up it twice, the next time you're able to run up it three times, the next time you're able to run up it four times, and etc. Or if you're lifting weights, first you can lift 20 pounds, then you can lift 25, then you can lift 30, right? And we all know that. We get stronger and we adapt. And this isn't about strength. This isn't about how much you can lift. This isn't about how fast you can run or walk a mile. It's about that definition of your ability to just carry out your daily activities without any complications. The law of adaptation, though, is very important. 
When you exercise, you produce better health. When you don't exercise, you produce more dysfunction and disease. That's black and white. That's not really my opinion. That's everybody's opinion because it's, a, it's just a fact there. So what does exercise do for us? What does it improve? This is another one that, you know, you can't really name anything that it doesn't improve, right? It improves literally every systemic function in your body. So in the short term, you go out and exercise today, what is your day going to look like? Well, you're going to have a better mood, okay? Exercise raises endorphins, which your body's natural painkillers, your feel-good hormones come from exercise. You're going to have a higher cognitive function. You're going to be sharper. They've tested this a number of times. You know, give somebody a, a, a quiz or a test, then have them exercise, then have them take it again, and they perform better. Their mind is sharper. They're thinking sharper. You're going to have improved sleep. Exercise helps regulate your hormones, like your endorphins, like your cortisol, like your insulin, two of the most important hormones that we have that control blood sugar, but they also control your cycles, including your sleep. So cortisol cycles throughout the day, and if cortisol is too high at the end of the night, you're not going to be able to sleep. Those are the people that lay in bed and their brains just keep racing and racing and racing. Their cortisol is elevated. Exercise helps regulate that. It also helps regulate weight loss. Uh, that's another one that you know, most, most people know. And we think about exercise, and that's mostly what we think about it for, is for weight loss. But I'm going to tell you that exercise is not, I don't associate exercise with weight loss. What I associate with weight loss is hormone imbalance. And there are ways other than exercise to, to affect the hormones. But exercise is a huge part of it. But that's what most people think. Well, if I'm skinny, like, like me, for example, people think, well, why do you need to exercise? Well, I don't exercise for weight loss. Obviously, I don't. if I lose any weight, I'll blow away in the wind. <laughs> uh, but I do it for health reasons, and it's because I'm focused on this big why right here. But weight loss, that's what most people associate it with. Along the same lines, that stress response, right below that. So the stress response is going to be more efficient when you're physically fit. It's another thing, it's just like we were talking about with uh, you know, your ancestors and running into a bear in the woods. Your body is designed to have stress. Stress is a really, really, really helpful thing. And you think about it, you know, if I run up a hill, what am I doing? I'm stressing my heart. I'm stressing my lungs. I'm stressing my legs. That's the only way that they grow. I'm stressing my cells. I'm stressing every part of my body. And that's the only way that they grow. So stress is actually a good thing. But when you have chronic stress, you have nonstop stress, which is most people today, that is really, really, really bad. And it throws off your stress hormones, which leads to weight gain, which leads to bad sleep, which leads to brain fog, and then that puts you in a bad mood. So all of these things are improved significantly from regular exercise. And it doesn't have to be a lot, but it just has to be regular. Uh, hormone sensitivity, that's you know, along the same lines. But these are short term. These are things that are going to happen immediately. Today's Saturday. If you exercise this afternoon, these are going to be happening for you. Balance is another huge one. You know, that's one of the biggest concerns in the elderly, right, is just slipping and falling. Slipping and falling, breaking a hip. So just talking about that alone, that problem alone. Exercise increases bone mineral density, big time. So you slip and fall on your hip, it doesn't fracture. It shouldn't fracture. Uh, exercise increases strength. So you're less likely to have a slip or a fall. Or if you are, you might be able to catch yourself better. And then you're balanced. You're less likely to even, even uh, you know, get, get off balance or trip over something or slip on the ice or slip off the stairs when you're physically fit. All those pathways get stronger and stronger and stronger. In the long term, not just in the short term, in the long term, what exercise can improve is your brain health, your overall brain health, your heart health, your lung health, your cellular health, your detox, your blood flow, your immune function. I want to talk about one of those really quick, but all those are, you know, we talk about all these all the time, brain health, heart health, lung health, cell health, detox, blood flow, and immune function all improved with exercise. 
But the one up there that you know probably makes the least sense is your cell health. And you know, here's a cell, just a big circle, right? And we all have 50 to 75 trillion cells in our bodies. But your cells have these things in them that kind of actually look like that. They're called, oh no, they're not. They're called mitochondria. Okay, mitochondria produce all your body's energy, your cellular energy, but all your energy comes from a cellular level, and they come from these mitochondria. When you exercise, you just like when you lift weights, you build more muscle fibers. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. When you exercise, you build more mitochondria. So if this is your average sound, say it's got a mitochondria here, as you exercise, you're going to get more here, here, here. And so you're producing, say we went from one mitochondria to four mitochondria, hypothetically, you're producing four times more energy per cell from exercising. And that's something that does not, is not like, you know, while you're in college and, and you play a sport or something that you get four times more energy. That's going to last throughout your lifetime. All the effects of fitness, all the effects of exercise, they don't go away that quickly. They do go away. You know, if you're a perfectly fit athlete and then you, you know, start sitting on the couch, and they've actually tested this. They took Olympic athletes, Olympic athletes, and put them in bed rest, and after a couple hours, less than a day, they could measure the metabolic shift that they were starting to change. But these changes, if you continue growing and building on these, you're just going to continue to get healthier and healthier and healthier. Your muscles will continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Even if they don't get a lot bigger, they'll get stronger. You'll get more ATP, more energy. There's no shortage of health benefits from exercising. Okay, so everybody knows that though, right? Everybody knows that exercise is good. Everybody knows that they should exercise. So why aren't they? And that's the number one thing that we want to focus on today is the why. Why we're going to exercise. The most important question that you could ever ask yourself about anything. Stockton, if you want to pull that up. Uh, so why? Why would you choose to exercise? Why do you choose to exercise? Why do you choose to get adjusted in our office? Why do you choose to be here today? Okay, so it's your choice, but you have to ask yourself why and start with why. So we're going to watch a quick little video about the why of exercise. Ellie, we get the remote. And... The phrase is called, how do I know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what. The key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to. We were in, uh, we were in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country. I do stand-up comedy probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple Let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Go ahead. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That rock could sing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. 
I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know the version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like Here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. Okay, so that, that's the why. And, and doesn't that make sense that you guys felt the difference between the first one and, and the second one. The first one, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. And so that's what you have to focus on with your exercise. How many people do you know that have joined a gym or started walking or lifting weights and they knew what they were doing, but they stopped two weeks later or two months later or they didn't continue because they didn't know why they were doing it, right? So we have to attach to our big why. So I want everybody, we're gonna do an exercise and just think about this why. This, is, this could make the difference between you know, your success or your, your failure when it comes to exercise. So if everybody will do me a favor and just close your eyes here, we're gonna do a little just illustration here. Okay, so I want you to, to think about something that makes you really, really happy. Okay, so it could be your big why. It could be your favorite hobby. It could be your favorite people. I'll just tell you mine, you know, a, a couple things for me is that I love skiing. That makes me really, really happy. But another one is my kids, right? And, and, and think about, too, what makes you happy and how, how you're going to continue doing that. Okay, so think five years down the road. What's this going to be like? What's this hobby going to be like? What are your kids going to be like? What's your family relationship going to be like? Think 10 years down the road. And I really want you to connect with that feeling of how happy that makes you feel. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Is there laughter? Is it just you by yourself? Is it you and your husband? Is it you and your kids? Is it you and your wife? Is it you and your parents? Okay, and that right there is your, your big why. And keep your eyes closed. But that might be your big why, and it might not be, you know, today. But it's something that you have to address and assess and discover what your big why is. But a lot of us, we discover our big why but here's the thing is we don't create any emotional attachment to that. So feel right now what that happiness feels like when you're able to do the things that you love, when you're able to eat the foods that you love and spend time with the people that you love. What does that feel like emotionally? And then I want you guys to do this. Think about that exact same thing. And I want you to create a scenario in your head where that's taken away from you. Okay, where well well, you're not able to do that thing that makes you happy. You're not able to be with the people that you love. Maybe you're on bed rest. Maybe you're in the hospital. Maybe you just can't physically do the activity that you were thinking about. Maybe you can't throw grandkids up in the air. Maybe you can't hike. Maybe you can't bike. Maybe you can't ski. Maybe 
You're so sick and you feel so bad, you can't spend time with your family, with your spouse, with your kids, with your parents. Maybe think about what they're going to feel like if you're not able to do these things, if you're not there for them, if you're not able to spend the time with them that they want to spend with you. Okay, so when you attach the positive emotion to it, the happiness that it brings, the joy, you also have to create and attach the negative emotion to that. That's what's called the consequence. So if you don't exercise, if you don't get fit, what is the consequence? And some of us are drawn towards pleasure, and some of us are drawn away from pain. There's two motivating factors for everything. It's either going to bring pleasure or it's going to avoid pain. And avoiding pain is a really, really powerful one. So you can open your eyes, but when you can connect an emotional attachment to your big why, that is the only way that you're going to succeed. And so that's what I would encourage you guys to think about is do that exercise on your own more. Think about how, what does my life look like now? What does my life look like in five or 10 years if I do do these things? What does it look like in five to 10 years if I don't do these things? And create an emotional attachment to that why. Because when your why is big enough, the what and the how will find a way. We don't need to focus on the what. We don't need to focus on the how. We need to spend 100% of our time focusing on the why. But let's give you some basic what's and some basic how's. The basic fitness what. So what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Uh, the, these are basic. Okay, so walk the neighborhood. Hike the mountains. Find a trail. Go for a hike. Hike a bike trail. Ride your bike. Bike a bike trail. Bike the mountains. Get a hobby. Right? Start, your, start a morning fitness routine. These are basic fitness what's. What are some other examples, shout out at me, that are pretty basic that anybody can do at any time to create a higher level of fitness? Really basic stuff. What do you guys think? Yoga. Yoga. Great one. Taking the stairs instead of the elevator, awesome one. How about like if you work at a desk job, just getting up and, and moving or doing five squats every hour? How much would that impact you? Five squats an hour, say you work eight hours a day, so 40 squats a day, 200 squats a week. Woo, that's 10,000 squats a year. That's gonna impact you dramatically, five squats every hour. When you break it down like that too, how easy does that sound? I can do five squats an hour, set an alarm on your phone, basic fitness what's. But do you realize that when you don't have a why, you're going to forget about this. But when you have a why and that trigger goes off, maybe the alarm on your phone goes off, you're going to get up, you're going to do those five squats because it's not about the work that I have to do right now, Tuesday at 9 a.m. It's more about where do I want to be Tuesday, 9 a.m., 10 years from now when you're focused on that why and you have that emotional attachment. How about some advanced fitness what? How about you could start a program, start a DVD. You know, there's, there's no shortage of exercise programs out there, right? There's just a shortage of people actually accomplishing them because they're not focusing on the why. There's enough what out there. There's enough how out there. There's not enough why out there. So a program or DVD. Uh, another challenge, you know, just like doing five a day, do something 20 times a day. Challenge yourself that I'm going to do something 20 times a day. Maybe for, for this next week, the first week of May, I'm going to do 20 squats a day. Like we just talked about. The squat challenge in May. Oh, you're doing a squat challenge? Nice. Well, yeah, uh, you know, Joanne just finished a, a push-up challenge. It was 22 push-ups a day for 22 days. And each day you had to ha grab somebody else to join the challenge with you. So there's ways to make it fun too. But do something 20 times a day. Maybe this week it's squats, and then maybe the next week, 20 jumping jacks a day. But you challenge yourself, every day I'm going to do 20 of these. When I watch like basketball games during the breaks, I always have to make myself just get up and do something. Nice. Else. Yeah, see, that's, that's an amazing thing is uh, commercial breaks. Yeah. They're there already, so yeah, use them. Get up during your commercial break, see how many squats you can do. Maybe make a game out of it. 
see how many squats you can do. Then the next commercial, try to beat it. Or try to just see where you're at. Or the next game that you watch, see last time I was able to do 15. This game I'm able to do 17. And as you continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger. You can do something like running stairs or hills. And then one of the most important things is hitting your target heart rate on a daily, daily basis. So our heart rates, this is one of the most important things. Like when we started off, and I mentioned that 85% of people say that they exercise three times a week, a lot of that's walking. A lot of that is just people getting out and walking. And that to me is not exercise. It's just moving. Okay, exercise doesn't just mean getting off your butt. Exercise means getting your heart rate elevated, getting your heart and your lungs elevated. What they found when they, when they you know, survey adults, most adults, the only time their heart rates get into their target zone is when they're doing adult activities with their significant <laughs> others. And for most adults, when they survey them, that doesn't happen that often either. <laughs> So you have to be intentional about getting your heart rate up. Seriously, that's like the number one source of physical fitness in our adult population, which is crazy. But hit your target heart rate daily. So what does that mean? What's a target heart rate mean? How can you measure this? One of the best things that, that we see in the office now is you know, the, the invent of Fitbits. Because people come in and they say, oh, I, I hit my target today. I hit my goal. Or when I go home, I've got to go walking because I'm only at 8,000 steps, and I want to get to 10. <laughs> yeah. So it, there's a lot of what. Yeah, and so there's people that will measure this, you know, religiously and track it and have charts and all this stuff. You don't have to do that. It's more of a feeling. You can feel when your heart's pumping. You can feel when your lungs are breathing. You can feel when you're out of breath. But what is your target heart rate and how is that measured? There's your target zone. Those two slides got mixed up. So your target heart rate zone, it's a really easy thing to measure. It's your max heart rate is 220 minus your age. Okay, that's a very generalized thing, but that's, that's the, the standard rule of thumb there. So your max heart rate, mi or 220 minus your age. So for me, my max heart rate is about 190. Okay, so if I had a heart rate monitor up, that's the number that I want to approach. I don't want to go over 190, and it'd be really, really hard for me to go over 190. On the other end of the spectrum, or just a little bit further down the spectrum, if you're 70, you don't want your heart rate, you know, it's not going to be the same as a 30 year old, as a 20 year old, as a 40 year old, or 50 or 60 year old. So 150 would be your max heart rate. So the first thing to do is find out what your max heart rate is. Then look at your target zone. Okay, so a target zone is about 75 to 90 or 100 percent of your max heart rate. So by getting into this zone, if you are, say, 50 years old, 170 is your max. But this is your target zone, 125 to 170. So every day, if you're measuring this, if you got into that target heart rate zone just one time a day, uh, like we talked about before, it could take one minute. There's a study that just came out that, that showed that in one minute of intense exercise, you get more benefit than 45 minutes of cardio. So in one minute, you could get your heart rate up to 125, and we're going to do it in a second. If you're 60 years old, get it up to 120. If you're 70, get it up to 115. An easy way to measure this if you don't have a heart rate monitor is to just measure it yourself. Just put your fingers on your pulse here, your radial pulse, and you can feel that. If you can't find that, there's other places where you can find your pulse. But instead of trying to track it for a whole minute, track it for 15 seconds. That's the easiest way to do it. Track it for 15 seconds and then times that by four. So what that would look like for each of these age groups, if you're 50 and you want to get to 125 to 170, you want to hear 30 to 40 heartbeats in that 15 seconds. Okay, you're going to count 30 to 40 heartbeats. Okay, I'm in my target zone. That's the quickest and easiest way to tell if you're getting into this zone is just by checking it yourself if you don't have a heart rate monitor. But that's a huge, huge thing is actually getting your heart and lungs pumping, not just getting your body moving. The easiest way and the best way, you know, there's a lot of different ways to exercise. And we've talked before about how, you know, long-term or long-duration long cardio can be harmful and, and things like that. But for the most part, we just want people 
to exercise. So any exercise is good exercise, but this is going to be the best exercise. This is called HIIT, is high intensity interval training. Okay, so high intensity, going at your highest intensity and doing intervals with it. What they found is that, like we talked about with that study, exercising for one minute versus 45 minutes, the benefits of your exercise are directly proportional to the intensity with which you exercise. <coughs> the intensity is what's going to be measured by your, by your heart rate. So if you're at a 100 beats per minute heart rate versus a 120, you're exercising at a higher intensity. That's why it's so important to get your heart rate up. That's how you can measure your intensity. But the amount of weight that you lose is directly proportional to the intensity. The amount of energy you're going to gain, just the amount of benefits that you're going to get overall are directly proportional to the intensity, not the amount of time that you exercise. That's probably the most important concept because how many people do we know go to the gym exercise for 45 minutes on the treadmill, they're not losing the weight that they want. So they say, okay, I'm not losing weight at 45 minutes. I need to go up to an hour. And I'm still not losing weight in an hour. I need to go up to an hour 15. I need to go up to an hour 30. It's not making sense. That doesn't, that's not the equation. That's not how it adds up. So you have to change the way that you're exercising to get more results in less time. That's also the number one objection. Right, because exercise doesn't cost anything. So money is not an objection. Time is the objection. Oh, I don't have time. Well, guess what? We all have the same amount of time. Okay, and I got time. So it, you have time, you have time, you have time. We all have time. We just have to find it. But so everybody stand up. We're going to do a surge exercise here. Now, we used to do these every Saturday. Jackie, you're a pro at these. You've done a million surges. Yeah, we need to do them again. Yeah. So what we're going to do, the easiest way to do this Let's pick the first one. Let's do um, running in place. Okay, so we're going to run in place. So everybody knows how to run in place. If you have bad ankles, bad hips, bad knees, keep your toes on the ground. Just lift your heels. But everybody should be able to run in place. Get your arms pumping too, unless you're holding a baby. <laughs> keep your arms. Keep your arms still. Seventeen pound baby. Wife. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the real challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you want physical fitness, carry these babies around. <laughs> you'll, you'll, be, you'll be fit quick. Uh, but, okay, so we're going to run in place. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go for 20 seconds. Okay, can we run in place for 20 seconds? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, so we're going to go as hard as we can, though, like we're being chased by a tiger. Okay, so hard and fast, but don't run into the chair in front of you or the person in front of you. Okay, so 20 seconds, then we're going to rest for 20 seconds. We're going to repeat this three times. We're going to pick three different exercises. What I want you guys to, to feel, the first one, Rio, we're going to run in place. You're going to do it with us? It's going to be fun. It's going to sound like a stampede. So feel the first 20 seconds. You know, you're going to be tired. You're going to be winded. But you're going to be like, okay, that was fine. That's 20 seconds of exercise. We're going to break for 20 seconds. Then we're going to do 20 more seconds. Okay, and then we're going to break for 20 seconds. Then we're going to do it a third time. So we're going to do it three times. Total, it's going to be one minute of exercise and one minute of rest. So two total minutes that we're going to exercise. Five seconds, running in place. Three, two, one, go. Run in place as fast as you can. Keep your arms pumping too. Keep your legs beating. Yep, good. Keep going. Okay, now we're 10 seconds. 10 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, time. Okay, so we can feel, you know, maybe uh, some, some, some tingling, tingling of the skin. Hey, this time, so we all have chairs. This time we're going to do one called sit down, stand up. So we're going to sit down and stand up. It is very functional. It is fairly easy, but you're going to be tired. Okay, so let me give you... I'm going to give you five more seconds. We're actually getting 10 extra seconds of rest here because I talked too long. Two, <laughs> one, go. Okay, sit down, stand up. Sit down, stand up. When you age, if you're elderly, I don't know when they start doing it, but this is one of the basic tests that they'll do at the doctor's office. Can you sit down and stand up? A few more seconds. Two, one, time. 
Okay, so that is one of the easiest exercises, but it is incredibly functional because think about it, as you age, how hard is it? You've seen some people, how hard it is to just sit down and stand up. Okay, the last one that we're gonna do, we're gonna do jumping jacks. So this is a full jumping jack jumping. This is modified, okay? So a lot of people do the modified. Don't feel bad to do modified. Yeah, get some space. Here's modified, keep one leg on the ground, left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg. The modified could sometimes be harder. You could almost go faster. You are getting longer breaks. Yes, it's like a, yes. That is very Napoleon Dynamite. Okay. We're going to get five more seconds here. So we're getting long breaks, but three, two, one, go. Okay, 10 more seconds. Double your speed. Double your speed. You want to go as hard as you can. Remember, it's about intensity. Three, two, one, time. Okay, have a seat. That is... I mean, that was, you know, it's kind of fun when we're here as a group, but that is the best way to exercise. That's what science, that's what research knows as the best way to exercise now. I love exercise. Well, actually, I, I, I could talk about it at the beginning. I actually hate exercise, but I love having fun. And, but this is one of my favorite topics. This is one of my degrees in, in health and exercise science. This is what I wanted to do was work with athletes and to determine, you know, how can somebody get more physically fit than the person that they're racing next to. This is one of my favorite things, but what we found is that it doesn't have to be super complicated. They don't have to go through an intense programming. They don't have to go through measuring their heart rate, measuring their body fat, measuring all these things. What most people need is they just need movement at a high intensity level. So when you surge, say this is your heart rate, this is time. As you surge, you go up, you go down. 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 Each time you go up and down, your body has to adapt. So if you're on the treadmill, let's say, your body has to adapt in the first couple minutes. Right, because it's got to get your heart rate up to, say, you know, 105, and you're walking on the treadmill at a pretty brisk pace. And, and then it just stays there the whole time. It doesn't have to adapt. Now that's good that it stays there, that your heart rate's elevated, but when it has to adapt up and down and up and down and up and down, it strengthens those pathways. What they've shown hormonally is that by exercising for as few as, until yesterday I'd heard it, as few as four minutes, but usually like 12 to 16 to 18 minutes of doing surge exercises actually changes your hormones for up to 36 hours after exercise. This is HGH, your human growth hormone, and testosterone, which are hormones that are really, really important for helping your body burn fat and build muscle, up to 36 hours afterward. If you're you know, going for a walk or you're on the treadmill, your body's in fat burning mode while you're on the treadmill. But as soon as you step off, it goes into recovery mode. And recovery mode is, is a stress mode. Where you do high intensity exercise, your hormones stay elevated 36 hours afterward. You don't produce the same amount of cortisol or stress hormones that you do from long duration aerobic exercises. Not to say that they're bad. I, I love long duration exercises still. I, I hate to say that, that one's better than the other. But this is the best and the most efficient way of exercising. Like we just said, you know, most people's number one objection is, well, I just don't have time. Well, who doesn't have 12 minutes? The DVD that we sell is 12 minutes of exercise. Actually, it's 12 minutes workout time. It's just like we just did. It's only six minutes of exercise because you go 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off. Half your time is spent during a break. When you go to, you say, that's what, what guy's doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's been kicking butt at it. So that is uh, the, the best and the most efficient and most effective way to, to exercise there. One of my favorite ways to surge is just to dance. Like, yeah. you know, having a good song? Yeah. I'm like, dance to the song. Yeah. Like, hard. Yeah. Like, just get into it. Yeah. And it's super fun. You don't even realize you're That's one of those things that's just, you know, when we started, we said, what do people think about when they think of exercise? They hate it. They hate it. They hate the thought of it. What do people think when they think of dancing? 
They love it. It's fun, you know. It's like most some people, I guess. Uh, but it's more fun than exercising. But yeah, that's the thing: is find a hobby, find something that's fun, find something that you like doing, not just going to the gym because you think that's what you should do. Uh, how many people do you think have you know treadmills and ellipticals and all these great intentions? that are now just like an extra hanger at their house. Yeah. They've got clothes hung over them and they've got boxes on them and they're just, it's just another piece of furniture. So find something fun. My son too tells me, you should be grateful I want to go to the skate park every day, mom. I could be like those kids that want to sit in front of the TV all day. Like, yeah. Yeah, you're right. But it's just exhausting he's, to five different skate parks. He's really day. smart and manipulative, but that's true. <laughs> 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 you should be thankful I want to go to the skate park. Yeah, that's, he's a genius. <laughs> that's what I tell JD. You should be thankful I want to go skiing. <laughs> uh, so the how. Okay, so we talked about the why. We talked about the what. So the how. Okay, and, and like we said, if your why is big enough, the how is going to find a way. Like, just get up and dance. You know, the how is really, really the easy part. But how? When your why is big enough. Uh, so join the gym. One of the things about gyms, Two-thirds of gym memberships go unused. Absolutely. Because it's, like we were just saying, exercise, and people hate it. Like, yeah. And if that means it works for you, it's great, but for most people, it's not going to stick because it's not enjoyable. Right. But I would say that a gym, too, and depending on what you do, like, you know, 24-hour fitness for me, I have a membership there. It's easy to skip. It's cheap. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, but CrossFit, it's over $100 a month. It's expensive. People don't skip. You know, or they, or they quit. They might quit. But they don't skip when you're invested when you, because you value it more. So join a gym if you have a financial commitment, especially if it's a stretch. I'm not saying join, like, the most expensive gym. But join a, a gym and, and put a, an investment into that. You know, people don't miss their, their visits in, in, in our office when it was tough for them financially to find a way to be a patient. If they don't care about the investment that they made into their health and into their spine and into their well-being, they'll skip all the time. But the people that really are, are, care about that investment, they want to get the most out of it. So that's why a gym can help. But yeah, absolutely. The gym, for most people, you know, d is not a, a good long-term thing. You want to have like, good classes or something yep. like that. Like that so that's way better than just having like, a partner. Next one, yeah, having a partner. Yeah, having a partner. So an accountability partner, yeah, that, that's, that's huge. You know, I used to work out three days a week at 5.30 in the morning, and if I didn't have a partner, I would have never made it. I would have never gone. I, I still would have exercised, but I would have said, ah, you know, I could sleep in today. I could do this. But I feel bad every time I miss if I text him and say, hey, you know, girls were up all night, not going to make it today. you got to lift on your own. Find somebody to spot you or whatever. I feel horrible about that. So it's the accountability is holding me accountable. That's the point of it, that you don't want to say no to that person. Now, if it's my wife, that's not a good of an accountability partner to me, because if, if, if we're going to exercise, we have a plan to exercise, and I say, hey, let's not do this today. It's not a big deal to me. But when it's somebody else, especially somebody you don't know very well, uh, you're going to be accountable. Another one is get a, a, a trainer. That's another thing, just like getting a gym, that you're going to put a financial investment into, and you're not going to no-show on that person. You're not going to not call. You're not going to not show up. You're not going to not work out if you get a personal trainer. We have a great personal trainer that's a patient here in the office that we work with, and he's awesome. He can take anybody from professional athlete status to you know, anybody at, at the lower end of the fitness spectrum and work with them where they're at, talk to them about their nutrition, talk to them about a plan and a program. And, and a lot of us, sometimes we just need to be told what to do. We need to have the why, but then we just need to be told what to do because we don't know what, what or how, or we get bored, or we don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Uh, another one, how? Buy some clothes or some equipment. Buy some, buy some shoes, buy some exercise clothes. Seriously, that, it's, it's, yes, all the women are saying, yeah, yeah. Like, that is incredibly powerful when you have exercise clothes. One of the things that we're going to leave off with is, is some action steps. One of the action steps is create a trigger. Sometimes the clothes can be the trigger. If you put your workout clothes on, you're probably going to end up working out even if you don't want to. So buy some clothes or buy some equipment. Now, like we said, there's a lot of people with treadmills and ellipticals laying around their houses. Uh, but maybe it's weights. Maybe it's a pull-up bar. Maybe it's 
uh, the, the resistance bands. Jay, can you take her out? Um, and then focus on your why. Focus on your why daily. Every single day, focus on that big why. And close your eyes and think through the emotional attachment, both the good and the bad, the emotional attachment of your why. So can I actually, on the, on the focus on it, yeah. Cut out some pictures of like Absolutely. see what you want to look like if you like want to like Yeah, create a vision or put it on the you know, put it on the background of your phone, you know, if it's your family, have a picture in your wallet. There's all kinds of things that you can do to cut you know, a lot of people will put a picture in their dashboard. You know, something that you see all the time that's always reminding you about your big why. And then when you think about that, you know, don't just see the picture, but remember that emotional attachment. You know, we closed our eyes. We did that for you know, maybe three or four or five minutes. But after you do this over time, you're, these pathways, neurons that fire together, wire together, it's going to get quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. And you can get yourself into that emotional state of mind like that once you've done it over and over and over again. So five action steps of how you can you know, develop your why, figure out the what, and make the how happen. Five action steps to just kind of tie this all together. So number one is evaluate yourself. Okay, what are your limiting beliefs? Like we talked about at the beginning, 85% of people say they exercise three times a week. Uh, what was the percentage of people that thought that they were healthy? Oh, no, it was 85% of people thought they were a healthy lifestyle is what it was. Excuse me. 51%. 51 said they exercise three times a week. Yeah, half of people. 85% of people, though, think they have a healthy lifestyle, and it's just not true. So you have to evaluate yourself and think, where, where am I missing? What's missing? Where am I really at health-wise? What are my limiting beliefs. That's one of the most important things you could ever figure out is what are my limiting beliefs. When you wake up and you're going to say, tell yourself that you're going to exercise at 630 in the morning, and say, okay, let's go through a whole example. Today's Saturday, say Sunday, probably a bad example, but say Sunday you're going to exercise at 630 in the morning. Well, Saturday night, think about why would I not? If I wake up tomorrow, my alarm goes off at 6.30, what am I going to tell myself? We all know the way that we talk to ourselves. What are my limiting beliefs? Oh, I don't have to. Oh, I, I feel fine. Oh, I don't need to lose weight. Oh, I, I can do it tomorrow. My kid. Blame it oh, my kid was my up kid. all night. Mm -hmm. This is my day to sleep in. Yeah, these are all limiting beliefs. You tell yourself that enough times, you believe it. These are limiting beliefs. So you got to find those, you got to discover those, and you got to squash them. you got to get rid of them. Uh, the second one, focus on your big why. That's one that we've already talked about you know, a, a lot. And find a, a trigger. Find a trigger for your big why. Not just a trigger to exercise, but a trigger to always be constantly reminding yourself about your why. I've heard the happiest we ever are is when we're looking to like a, like a vacation coming up. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, so and I think of, you know, that visualization too of like, because you're anticipating that, that vacation, what you're going to do. And a lot of times that's the only motivation people have to lose weight. It's like, oh, I'm going on vacation. Yeah, yeah, we hear that all the time. That come in, hey, I've got a vacation. I'm going to Hawaii in three months. You guys, you guys help people lose weight, don't you? Like, yeah, but so, so in, in that, um, you know, that story or that picture, how long term is that change going to be for that person? Yeah. It's not, yeah. right? But when they're why is because I got two kids and I want to be around for them when I'm 70 and I want to throw them up in the air and take a mountain biking like my grandpa did with me and stuff like that, that's a why that I can attach to every single day, even though it's really, really far off. Yes, and so, I, that, so how you can tie those together, I think, is holding that same excitement that you do for a vacation for your other things that you're visualizing too. So yeah. Hold on to that same excitement when you're visualizing 15, 20 years down the road. Yeah. So, and, and yeah, so future pace yourself. Think about, and, and, and at the same time, though, I'd add, Chelsea, that like, you know, we talked about that, that's moving towards pleasure, thinking about the good things that are going to come from this. But at the same time, for some of us, it might be more powerful to think, what if I don't do this? What's the painful future look like? But yeah, look into the future and really paint that picture and have an emotional attachment to that picture. Uh, number three is change your dialogue. That goes along with your limiting beliefs. 
But that's your internal and your external dialogue. What are you saying? What are you saying in your head? What are you saying to yourself? What are you saying to other people? Oh, I tried exercising, but it, it, it just wasn't for me. Or I've tried to like going to the gym, but I, I just can't. Uh, I hate that word. I, I just can't. Uh, you, you can. That is complete crap, but that is what we tell ourselves all the time. Well, I'm just not a morning person. I'm just not an exercise person. Those are limiting beliefs. You to you've told yourself that for so long that you now believe it, and when you believe it, you become it. And so just like what you've already become from your beliefs, change your beliefs. Change who you're going to become in the future from here moving forward. Number four, set a trigger or a cue. So for any habit, there's always a trigger. For a lot of us, our habits, we don't even think about it. We wake up in the morning, and maybe when we get out of the shower, we brush our teeth every single day. That, and we never think about it, but that, it, it's, not the, it's the shower that triggers the brushing the teeth. We don't think about it like that, but there's always a trigger to every habit. So find a trigger for your fitness or for your exercise. Maybe it's just your alarm clock. That's a, that's, that's a good one. You're motivated. As soon as my alarm goes off, I'm going to work out. Maybe it's putting your, your workout clothes on, putting your shoes on, putting your clothes on. Even if you don't feel like it. Say you absolutely just don't feel like exercising. Put your clothes on, things will change. You're not going to end up not exercising once you get the clothes on. But set a trigger or a cue every single time and develop that habit. And then number five, probably the, the most important one, you know, it, it, I, I think that, Chelsea, this you know, talks about what you just talked about. So many people exercise and they hate it, but they're doing it because they want something in the future, right? They want to lose weight. They want to look a certain way in their bathing suit, or they want to, to be able to play with their kids and be, be a good you know, grandparent, great grandparent 50 years from now. But, but so many times we, we hate the process. And if you can learn to love the process, it's going to change everything. Well, like for me, like when I first started here and then was able to like start exercising again, um, I, of course, didn't like it. But the longer I did it, the more I liked it. Yeah. I had to push myself first, but now it's like when I don't, I start getting antsy. Yeah. Skin, yeah. And I'm like I'm jonesing for it. Like, oh. And, and all five of these... <laughs> All five of these uh, are, are, are really intricately intertwined because, you know, if, if you hate exercise, start telling yourself that you love it. Yeah. Even if you still hate it, tell yourself that you love it on a daily basis. I love exercising. I'm doing it for my kids or for my family. I'm doing it at five o'clock on the dot every single day. I'm going to do that. I'm not going to tell myself that something else more important is going to come. You know, all five of these you can do all at once, but learn to love the process is probably the most important thing. How well do you think people are going to do sticking with something that they hate? Not well. Not well, right? Nobody's ever going to stick with something that they hate long term. So instead of just continuing to hate it, change that. That's a choice, whether you like something or you don't like something. We think that, oh, I'm just not a morning person. I'm just not an exercise person. I'm just not a, a, a healthy eating person. That's because you became that person. You made yourself that person. You can make yourself somebody else. So who cares about teaching you the exercise program or measuring your heart rate or you know which weights to lift and how? Only focus on the why. Only focus on forming the habit. The number one thing that holds people back from becoming the person that they want to be in any area of life is their mindset. And when you can change that, you can change everything downstream of that. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.